Welcome to Weston Park Baptist Church Virtual Service. I usually say that even though we're not together physically, I know that we're together spiritually, and that I can't wait till that we can gather together again soon. The good news is we can, and we will. On July 4th at 1045, we will be having our outdoor service over at the Metrolink side. If you are able to attend, send me an email or leave a message on the church voicemail. There will also be more information after the worship service, and you will also get more information in the upcoming newsletters. So we look forward to seeing you, we miss you, and we are so excited. We are back. Over the last few weeks, Pastor Allen's sermon series has been on a God who comes, a God who comes to us, a God who loves us, a God who cares for us, a God that adores us, a God that wants a relationship with us, a God that believes in us, and a God that dwells within us. That's pretty awesome if you think about that. I truly, truly understand and think about that. For me, over the years, having that comfort has been the thing that has taken me through many troubled things. Now this week's sermon is titled, A Kingdom Built on Love. Imagine a kingdom built on love. God is love. Imagine if we could truly love our neighbors as God loves us. What an awesome world that would be. A place where, even though we may not agree with each other or understand each other, we love each other and we reach out in kindness. A friend of mine, a friend of mine sent a video a video on kindness, about a community that continued to give to each other without thinking about themselves. A community that met the needs of others before thinking of what that would mean and just reached out and touched someone. It was a beautiful effect of love just flowing throughout the universe to the point that it made me quite emotional. And I thought, I want to strive to live on a kingdom built on love. So as we listen to Pastor Alan's sermon today, may our hearts be softened and may our minds be open to hearing the words that God is giving us to grow as Christians. Let's bow our head in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we know we serve an awesome God, so worthy to be praised. May we in this time be still and not be distracted, dear Lord. May we hear the words that are designed for us to hear to get us throughout the week. May we realize the opportunities we have that when we love others as you love us, the joy that will bring us in abundance. And dear Lord, may we be mindful of not just who you are, but whose we are. And dear Lord, I thank you for the blessings that you have given us and those yet to come. And all these things I ask in your precious name. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Another day to be in your amazing presence and feeling your sweet love enveloping us and protecting us. We give you thanks for bringing us through this week and guiding us in the difficult uh, challenges that we faced. Almighty Father, thank you for loving us despite how we sometimes act or think. We ask for forgiveness for the ways that we work for our own glory, control, and comfort. Holy Spirit, show us how to truly love the Father with all our heart, our soul, mind, and strength. And reveal to us the habits and mindsets and attitudes that prevent us from truly surrendering ourselves to the Father. And turn the eyes of our community hearts outwards so that we are inspired to use our gifts to serve others. Heavenly Father, we pray for the sick, those unemployed, and those who are dealing with family matters, those that are in the hospital. Comfort their hearts, heal their bodies and souls. And Abba Father, I pray for our church family. I pray for Gavin and Elaine Smith in the passing of their son, Eric. I pray for Betty Cullen in the passing of her husband, John. And I pray for the family and friends of Dorothy Sims, who recently passed away. And dear Lord, may we hold Karen Fox in prayer as she comforts her family and her sister Heather, who has stage four cancer. And dear Lord, we give thanks for Tom Legg for his successful surgery and him being at home and recovering. And we give thanks that Linda Watson is at home and recovering and recuperating from a recent fall. And Abba Father, our hearts cry out for our Indigenous sisters and brothers as yet another grave site has been uncovered. These horrific discoveries are a wake-up call for us all to address the racial injustice and evil that has happened and continues to happen in our world. Let us never forget that we all share this world together and whatever happens to one of us impacts all of us. Father God, there are so many hurting and struggling in these difficult times. Daily, we hear of so many tragedies happening around the world. Father God, you know them all by name. We lift them up to you. Protect their hearts and their loved ones. And as the school year is ending and we are slowly reopening, help us to adjust to this new normal by caring and loving one another as you have loved us. Help us to love not just those close to us, but to reach outside of our comfort zone and walk with our sisters and brothers with a renewed heart. And we give thanks to the role of each person in our lives and community um, and helping us to get to know you better. And Father God, I pray for the unity among all believers, regardless of our culture, language, or religion. We have been made family through the blood of Christ. We give thanks that your love, Abba Father, is for people everywhere. May we look at others as you see us. May we be less judging and more loving. All these things I pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Luke 10, verses 25 to 28. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Thank you for being with us uh, once again on our virtual services here at Weston Park Baptist Church here uh, locally, and, and we know there are a few who watch from a distance, so thank you for coming. Today we uh, finish this series on a God who comes toward us, reminded that God always is there, always coming, always wanting to reveal himself to us, always reaching out. So he is as close to us as our breath. Remember, Jesus says at one point that the kingdom of God is within you. So the Gospels present a God who comes and dwells within us, particularly through Christ and through the Holy Spirit, 
God is not a deist God, not a distant God, but he's right there for us. <clears throat> and so the invitation then is to know God in that intimate way. And we've said that really this is the great question in life is, you know, will we come into a living contact with our creator, redeemer, God? It's a great invitation, one I hope that we are all wanting to pursue. But the challenge we face, all of us, is that we get distracted, we continue to focus mainly on ourselves, on our own self-interest, that we don't fully open ourselves to God's agape love and then that love for others. So we, we in a way, hedge our bets because we want to take care of ourselves, even though we're called to reach out to others. So we, we create these blocks. It's like the gospel story where Jesus tells a parable. Many people are invited to the banquet, and you remember people start making excuses. I have to go to a wedding, or I have some property that I have to sell. I have some business to take care of. And th those are the examples that Jesus uses, and, and we often do much the same. So we get uh, caught up in all that we are doing in our lives, the good things, the challenges, and then the invitation to know God recedes. So th that, that's the challenge, and we all face it. And so what we're invited to do is to create space for God in our lives, to allow that conversation to continue to grow. And so we have the invitation, but we also put up some barriers. So as we finish, we're going to look at a story from the Gospel of Luke, and it's a reminder of what is the essential thing, and can we keep that essential thing in mind as we live our lives, Kierkegaard, to will one thing. So with that in mind, then, let's uh, read a, a text. You remember the story where a lawyer one of the learneds comes to Christ and asks him a question, but it's not a, a real question. It's a, it's a test, the text tells us. So Luke 10, starting at verse 25, 25 to 28, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. <clears throat> Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, well, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, well, that's a good answer. You've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. So that in, in this little pearl, gospel pearl, we have a, an important piece that speaks to this question of God coming towards us in our response. So it begins with this dialogue, and we, we know the story well, we don't have to overemphasize uh, it, but it begins with two questions. So a lawyer, an expert, a person of the upper class, remember Israel, Middle East in that day was particularly a class society, so this lawyer, PhD, upper class, he asks a question to Jesus to test him, the gospel says. So it's not an honest question. He's trying to catch Jesus in some way, this young rabbi, Jesus, from Galilee. And, you know, this expert thinks he can probably catch him in a, in a quandary. And so he asks this question about eternal life. How do I receive eternal life? And this may be playing on a division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees did not. So there was a difference of opinion between these learned groups. And so perhaps the lawyer is trying to catch Christ up here to, you know, lay out his cards in a way that will uh, antagonize some of the public around him. So the lawyer asks the question and then Jesus responds with another question, not a bad tactic, and he says, well, what is written in the law? Essentially, what do you read there? What you tell me. So these two questions frame the the initial conversation. And then two assertions are made. The lawyer cites the law, the fundamental Old Testament law, 
We see it in Deuteronomy 6, 5, to love God fully and to love your neighbor as yourself, the Old Testament law. And Jesus hears that and he responds and asserts, well, that's a good, again, do this and you will live. You have answered correctly. So in a way, Jesus is saying that this Old Testament law of loving God and loving neighbor, responding to the God who comes toward us, is the same both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because Jesus, who is speaking in this age of the New Covenant, he says, well, it's, that's, that's the law and, and nothing has changed. <clears throat> so we are to continue to love God fully, wholly, and love our neighbor as ourselves. So that law remains for us. So the key thing in our <clears throat> daily living is that we are to be responsive to God's love and to return that. And then when we return that, that spills over to others and they also experience love. So we're reminded of our service last week when we focused on Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 13 that the greatest of these is love, that wonderful hymn of love. We are to treat one another with patience and kindness and gentleness, respect. That's, that's how we are to live. And then so as we conclude, we, we hear Jesus be saying the same thing. So love is to be our centered response. Edward Farrell you know, uses a little word game where he says we are to move from the I of live, the self-interest of live, I live my life focused on me, the I, and we're to go from that I have lived to the O of love, the other of love. To move beyond self-interest, to honestly be concerned for those around us, to move from live to love. That's what Farrell says. And, and that resonates with this command, to love God fully and wholly. To love is to become the foundation, the, the, the ground of our being in terms of how we relate to others. We're to move beyond self-interest. And indeed, the text says that we are to love God with all our body, soul, spirit, mind. All of those dimensions of ourselves, meaning to love God holistically. Love in a full way. So that's not a bad invitation because it means in our day to day, we need to allow God's love to touch our whole person. So one author, his name is Jim Marion and he has a book called The Mind of Christ. He suggests to us that we love God fully and wholly in this way that we love him with our body, meaning that we need to allow space in our body to respond to God. So our body is refreshed to open ourselves up to God physically. Could be through meditation, could be through uh, contemplation, being in nature, allowing our body to resonate with God's goodness. Body, spirit, well, allow ourselves to engage with God in prayer, for example. That, that's God's speaking to our spirit and our mind, reading the scriptures, reading other spiritual books, whatever that might be, but to allow ourselves to be impacted by God in a holistic way, to love God with our body, soul, mind, spirit. A holistic love for God, that's the invitation. So that we rise above these barriers that we often put up for ourselves, and one of them is indifference. That I just don't care about anybody else, really, or, or most people. I just care for very few people, and I'm indifferent to everybody else. I don't care about them. Well, the love of God calls us to move beyond indifference. If I am just focused on myself and my family and a few friends, and I'm totally indifferent to everybody else, well, then we are missing out on what Christ is inviting us to in terms of agape love. Or another response we often choose is hardening. We harden our hearts. The psalmist will say that, do not harden your hearts as Israel did at the waters of Meribah. Do not harden yourself. 
hard soil. The water comes and just bounces right off. So those, those responses of indifference and hardening our hearts, they keep us from loving God and being attentive to God and then displaying that in our love for other people. So to keep God central, the little proverb says, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Well, that works also, unfortunately, for our relationship with God, too. If God is out of sight, meaning we're just forgetting him, dwelling on everything else, out of sight, out of mind, then, then God will recede. He doesn't overwhelm us. He invites us to answer and to respond in the invitation of love, little signs of God's love, being aware of God's love. You know, I was, I was out of town on uh, the last few days, and it was night, and so I went outside. It was, I don't know, 10 or 11 at night, and, and where I was, I was, I was startled when I came out the door with a flash of light. And I, I, I looked at it. I, I didn't know what that was. And then as I started looking more, I saw little bits of light happening everywhere. And, and I was just stunned with this reality of, of fireflies at night doing their thing and shining. And it's been the longest time. I remember as a kid seeing that somewhere, but it, 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 to me it was just a reminder of God's creation and his goodness of all this light flashing in a way that I wasn't anticipating. And it just, wow. For me, that was God speaking to me through his creation, through nature. So whatever it is for us to be open, to be aware in our day to day so that we know God's presence, God's goodness. Remember that God is always new. God does not grow old. God is new every day, fresh every day. And so our relationship with him is to be invited to have this newness every day. God's newness. By the way, it's one of the reasons why I think our development piece is a good thing for us as a community because it's new. It's totally new. Shakes up the, the community. It, 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 it wakes us up in a sense. So there's an invitation here to newness that I think is healthy for the community of faith. Wake up to new things that God wants to do in our midst. So we can ask ourselves, well, where are we seeing God's newness? What invitation is there for us in your life, my life, of God's newness and his voice to us? So love God with all your heart, soul, and your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's the command. Old Testament, New Testament. Well, the conversation doesn't end there, and we know where it goes from there. The, the, the lawyer says, um, well, who was my neighbor? And so there, there is a response of the lawyer. He wants to dig a little bit deeper on that and to say, well, where, where do the lines of love, where do they close? Where do they draw? I want this command to be a bit more selective. I want it to be partial. I can't possibly love everybody. I want to just love some people within my circle. I, I want that. So who is my neighbor? That's essentially what he's saying with that. And again, Jesus does not respond with a proposition. He responds by telling in the story, and it's the story of the Good Samaritan. And so we know that well. We don't need to retell it completely. Man is beaten up, robbed, injured on the road to Jericho. He's left to die. And then we're told a series of individuals come by. A priest comes by, walks on the other side. A scribe comes by, walks on the other side. Both religious people, both treating this person indifferently, really, because of their own desires, their own self-interest, whatever. They would have had reasons, but it's self-interest. And then finally, a third person comes along. It's the Samaritan, hence called the Good Samaritan, one of the other one of the people that we wouldn't anticipate, Jesus' audience wouldn't anticipate this Samaritan to be the one who comes and shows compassion and mercy. But that's exactly what happens. And you remember it's the Samaritan who binds up the man's wounds, puts him on his own animal, gets him to a, an inn, 
takes, makes sure he's taken care of, pays for continual uh, concern and, and regard for this individual. He's the good Samaritan. Jesus tells that story. And then at the end, he says to the lawyer, well, you tell me, who, 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 who was the neighbor in this story I told? And the lawyer's got to say, well, I, I guess it was the one who showed mercy and compassion. And Jesus says again, right, totally right, go and do likewise. So the one who shows compassion, the one who shows mercy, that's the one who is showing love. Where does the end of neighbor end? Where, where is it? Jesus says, well, there, there's no end. It's to co show compassion and mercy to all that we engage with. Sharon Ringe says, no one can simply have a neighbor. One must also be a neighbor. Neighboring is a two-way street. So we, we must be that neighbor. And that's what Jesus is inviting us. So we live in a day of building fences, building barriers, wherever. We see examples of that everywhere. Israel-Palestine right now, big story in our news. And we, and we hear how, you know, there are defenses built there. Israel building a fence to keep the Palestinians in their place. But not just there, immigration, border control, prejudice that we engage with, animosity towards other. The call to be loving towards all, to our neighbor, is, is greater than ever. In 2,000 years, we've, we've made really no headway on this thing. We're still building fences and saying, this is the other, and I will not take care of the other. In fact, I'll build barriers so that I don't have to relate to the other. So we build fences instead of loving our neighbor. We want to say, somebody is not our neighbor. That's how we respond. So we don't welcome the stranger, which was pivotal in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, to be kind, gracious, 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus says in the, in the Sermon on the Mount that we are even to love our enemy. So, I mean, you know, who's your enemy? Who, who might you put in that camp, enemies? Well, for Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus says that you and I, we are to love our enemies. And that's a, a massive leap, right, in how we are to relate to other people. If our world really was acting that way, where we love our enemies, things would be completely different. Paul wraps it up in Galatians, for the whole law is summed up in a single command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Galatians 5.14. He says the whole law is summed up here. Just love your neighbor as yourself. Paul speaking to the Jewish community to love Gentiles, speaking to the Gentiles to love one another, other Gentiles. The whole law is summed up in love. That's the invitation. So God comes towards us in love. The command to love God, to love our neighbor, all the way through the, the scriptures, New Testament, Old Testament. God comes to us so that there might be this kingdom of love. A, a culture of love, reaching out to people in love, a God may love, selfless love. And, you know, we, and we've all messed up here. We've all injured others instead of loving others. We, we know we've all done that. But nevertheless, the command and the invitation is there for us to move beyond self-interest and to receive this God who comes towards us in love and reveals himself in so many ways. And of course, the good news for us is that Jesus, Jesus is also the good Samaritan for you and for me. Jesus is the one who binds us up even when we mess up. Even when we go down roads that we shouldn't go down, Jesus is there for us. He comes along. He is not indifferent to us. He does not harden his heart towards us. No matter how we've treated him, he is the good Samaritan who loves us, who loves you. Who loves me? He is the one. He's always there for you. 
Every day, Jesus, the Good Samaritan, for you, for me. We need to hold on to that truth. We need to hold on to that story when we think that nobody loves us. When we see ourselves as the big victim. We need to be reminded and know that, well, God loves me. Jesus loves me. We saw that last week. He believes in me. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, he believes in me. He hopes in me. He endures me. He bears me. He does the same for you. So I like uh, this word by uh, Tilaki. Let me just read it for you. I have it here. Jesus loves us, and therefore he finds us. And therefore he also knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And still he does not drop us. Still he remains our friend, our nearest friend. Jesus knows all about us. When we mess up, he doesn't say, well, that's it, that's it, I'm done with you. He endures us. As a close friend, he's there for us. He keeps believing and loving us. God is the God who comes towards us, towards you. So you're weak this week, no matter what's gone on, what other challenges you have experienced, whatever rejections you have experienced. God, in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, believes in you and comes to you in love. Jesus is your friend, and he will never leave you, never forsake you, he says. May we hear his word. May we be encouraged by his word. May we allow his word to sink deep into our hearts and souls and minds and not bounce off, not putting up the shield so it's reflected away. Receive it. A God who comes towards me, a God who comes towards you. Each day, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.